Um, Eric Farnsworth, to my right, is my colleague, the man who actually recruited me to uh, the American Society Council of America, so I'm hoping he still is proud of that. Um, the, uh, he also has an article on this issue and has written extensively before on the issue of uh, China and Latin America um, and about what Washington should do if it can do anything about uh, that relationship. Um, Ines Bustillo is the Washington representative of ECLAC, CEPAL, also the source of a lot of the data that we have in here. Um, the charticle, which is uh, by way of definition, a charticle is the rather cutesy way we refer to the graphics that we do in, in the magazine in each issue. It's a chart, it's an article, has a narrative. Um, it's sort of an inside pool term. The, um, but all of the data that in that particular case uh, for this issue drew from uh, St. Paul. Uh, and also uh, the ECLAC St. Paul economist, um, Osvaldo Rosales and his researchers have a very uh, original article on how Chinese exports are competing for market share with Latin American economies. And last, you arrived just in time, I was trying to draw out the introductions until you got here, is Arv Arvind Subramanian, uh, who is a senior researcher here, senior fellow here, and also has a book out uh, called Eclipse about the rise of China, and seems to have a, an article on China in every issue of Foreign Affairs that comes out now. Uh, seems to be a regular columnist. So actually, if you don't mind, Arvind, even though you're the, the last to arrive, I can ask you to go first, to sort of set the stage a little bit about China's rise, its implications, um, not just obviously in Latin America, because we like to talk about this in a more global context, uh, and what you, where you see it going. Uh, <laughs> uh, thanks very much, Chris. Um, uh, I'm told that this is a kind of conversational panel, right? Yes. So, so, so I don't want to hold forth uh, for too long. So, so, so let me just make, I, I think I'll make three points, uh, all, all drawn from my book. Um, the, the first point is, is that I think um, China's economic rise is more imminent in time, uh, much broader in scope, and much greater in magnitude than anyone currently imagines. Uh, and uh, you know, I have some numbers to show this. Uh, you know, based on very conservative assumptions about Chinese growth and, and um, American growth, but I think uh, uh, you know, in, in about China is already very uh, dominant. I think in many ways, but I think in 10, 15 years, uh, I'm predicting that the differential between China and the U.S. as su economic superpowers would kind of uh, be similar to uh, the differential between the U.S. and, and, and other powers in the post-war years and comparable to the U.K. Uh, at, at, in, in the heyday of empire. And one aspect of the broader in scope point, I think, is that in, in 10, 15 years, I think that renminbi will probably be uh, certainly a reserve currency, but maybe even the premier reserve currency. So that's, I think, uh, uh, I take that almost as uh, highly likely to happen. So, so the question then is, you know, so, so what does it mean uh, for the rest of the world? Um, my own view is that, you know, I think because China is so dependent on the current system for its own growth, given that its development a process is far from finished, given that you know it, it needs the open trading and financial system, it will have a stake in preserving the system that basically the United States bequeathed after World War I, after World War II. So, so there's a very high probability that you know uh, by and large we'll have this system as we know it, you know, and that will survive Chinese economic dominance. But I think we can't be sure of that. I, I think there is a small probability. Not, maybe not small, maybe not so small. Some probability that you know, uh, uh, things might go wrong. And I think the world needs to take out some insurance against the possibility that China might exercise its economic hegemony in somewhat unbenign ways. And I have you know, uh, 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 so, uh, actually a very controversial proposition to put forward, which is that uh, you know, I have a piece where I say that, uh, which builds on my book, which say that basically that in economic terms, instead of trying to contain China, I think what the U.S. and the rest of the world needs to do is actually to empower China even more in the economic realm. Um, and to give you a couple of examples, for example, I think that the way the IMF is run, I think China needs to contribute more to make the IMF much bigger, but in return it should get a, a voice and say comparable to the U.S. and certainly greater than that of which is now uh, a supplicant and a debtor. Uh, another thing that I think 
the rest of the world should do is, is uh, you know, promote the rise of the, of the renminbi, N not just you know, be warily watching the rise of the renminbi, but actually promote it. Because the more you can create a stake for China in the open system, and, and you know, uh, uh, if the renminbi becomes a reserve currency, that stake will increase for China. I think the more we can kind of, uh, 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 there are no guarantees in this business, but at least the more we will align China's incentives with that of the open uh, uh, financial and trading system. So with that, let me stop and then we... In the, in the mode of, of more conversational panel, let me just ask you sort of a very specific question is not to sound too much like a realist here or that the same economically is between the United States and China is zero sum, but, you know, what, you know, what are the benefits for the United States for doing that and what are the risks? Because you're, you're actually offering to cede a lot of authority to China. You know, aren't there risks in that um, for U.S. sort of economic uh, power and influence? Yeah. So, 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 so um, <clears throat> Two or three responses to that. You know, first, <laughs> I think uh, I think the you know the United States has to kind of slowly come to the realization first that you know its options are not unlimited. So part of what part of what I'm saying, a subtle message is you know let's make a virtue of necessity. You know, uh, don't think you have too many options. You know, and, and you, you take current. I mean, take the exchange rate for example, not just the U.S. but the rest of the world. To change China's policies and with absolutely no effect, and we're heading in that direction. So, so point number one, I think the uh, ability of the U.S. to, I mean, or the degrees of freedom that the U.S. has, have is much less than what we think. So, so you know, uh, point number point number two is that I think the larger objective for the United States must be uh, to preserve the open system that it created. So in a sense, if you keep that overall objective in mind, or, or, or what I'm advocating is actually trying to make sure that even though in some sense this means less power for the US and more for China, what we're trying to do is to align Chinese incentives in favor of preserving that open system, which must be the larger US objective. Uh, and so it's in that sense that you know, even though it might you know, involve some a diminution of uh, U.S. economic power and dominance, uh, I think it's in the direction of, you know, U.S. overall strategic interest. Great. Thank you very much. Ines, talk a little bit about the growth of uh, uh, China and Latin America, and uh, both in all of its economic dimensions, investment, trade. Well, thank you, Chris, and congratulations on the magazine. It's, it's absolutely wonderful, and I could not resist the temptation a few more slides, and thank you for that. I know it's it's more of a panel, but I wanted just just to show. I mean, I want to make two points that the relationship, the China Latin America relationship, presents tremendous opportunities. Has been tremendously beneficial for many countries and many sectors, but also has presented and will present uh, challenges in the future. Now, what can be done about that? And I'm going to illustrate that with a few trade and foreign direct investment figures. What can be done about that? Well, policy matters and policies at the domestic level, at the sub-regional, regional coordination, more integration at the global level, as well as more dialogue and more getting to know a China and China getting to know a Latin America. Now, in terms of uh, a trade, uh, as it was uh, being said, trade, uh, you find that uh, China is a yellow line, and you see particularly how since the year 2000, a, a Latin American exports to China have been increasing and also imports from China have been increasing. Approximately 8% of Latin American exports go to China, 13% of imports are coming from China. In the case of the U.S., which is the, the blue line, approximately 40%. So still the U.S. is the largest uh, trading partner for uh, the region. It has been growing and it will probably keep growing and mostly that is associated with the rise in the price of uh, commodities. Now, that I'm going to leave of course, these uh, slides, in, in terms of trading partners, but for the region as a whole, the U.S. still holds uh, the first position. Forty percent of, uh, uh, of uh, exports uh, and, and imports are, are with the U.S. a share. And then you have the rise of China. Uh, sorry, it's eight, uh, about eight, nine percent in, in Asia. And then Latin America. Latin America trades with itself about uh, its 20 percent uh, of the share. So. You see that, of course, there's different, the, there are differences by country, and in the case of Peru, in the case of Chile, a, a China is the most important trading partner, and China is the most important trade in the, among the five most important trading partners for other uh, Latin American countries. So, yes, it has been great.
and that mostly is explained by uh, natural uh, resources. Now, uh, extractor, what uh, type of uh, um, extractor of course, by main destination, and that is clearly what we have been been observing that most of the trade with China takes place in the uh, with natural resources, uh, mostly South America exporting uh, natural resources, but uh, also uh, and and when you look by other regions of the world, uh, mostly trade with the U.S. is in 60 percent is in manufacturing, also with Latin America, and there are opportunities and challenges of this structure of exports. Uh, of course, if you are uh, exporting natural resources, you get uh, a, a money for that, that, that is crucial. There are dangers of a reprimarization of the economies. But that is the current structure of exports and how it has evolved a, a, in the past years due to trade with, uh, with China. Now, foreign direct investment flows. A, Latin America had uh, last year a, a very high, a, we attracted uh, foreign direct investment a, at a, at a We're going to be releasing our numbers in about a month and we expect a, a, a near record a, as well. Uh, China is a player. I'm going to show China later on. Uh, and in terms of who's getting it, uh, Brazil has been a magnet for a foreign direct investment over the past years, and it will be a magnet uh, for foreign direct investment uh, in, in 2011. Across the board, not only natural resources, but also manufacturing and services. And then you have a uh, by country, and countries that are rich in natural resources have been attracting a substantial uh, foreign direct investment, but not only into natural resources, also we find it, uh, investment coming into technology and other uh, sectors. Now, China in the area of foreign direct investment. The rise of China as a foreign direct investor in the region has been quite recent. Uh, and in 2010, China uh, was the third largest investor in the region after the United States and the Netherlands. And Chinese foreign direct investment amounts to about uh, 8, 9%. So it's growing in importance, it's not still a very large player. It is a large player in some sectors in natural resources, because mostly about more than 80% of Chinese investment is going into natural resources in the region. Now, of course, it's not dominant in all extractive industries in the region yet. If one, if one extractive industry that it would be dominant would be the copper in Peru, which we expect a Chinese investment to have sort of about 25% of production by the end of the decade. And, uh, and here we have once again a destination of foreign direct investment a, by sub-region and very clearly the partner of manufacturers, services, a, natural resources. Now, what can be done? Has it been beneficial? Yes, it has been beneficial. A, exports have increased. And we cannot explain part of the growth of South American countries without its trade relationship with China. Has it presented challenges? It has presented challenges. Not only the typical breakdown between natural resource exporting countries versus manufacturing exporting countries, but it, countries have been facing and are being facing ever increasing competition from Chinese products in the domestic industries. So very many manufacturing sectors are quite vulnerable. And in terms of foreign direct investments, the reprimarization of the economies, et cetera. Now, what can be done? I think it was said earlier that uh, nothing stays the same. And dialogue is crucial. There's a very incipient trade and investment relationship. There's not much knowledge of both regions. So any type of exchanges between the regions will be crucial. Just in November, the first, let's say, Latin America Chinese uh, think tank summit took place. There have been five business summits, that type of dialogue with China is crucial, and also the world of a public policies at the national level, at the sub-regional, at the national level, more into resources in trying to become more competitive, more resources and productive policies into trying to add more value to exports, into trying to insert itself more into the Chinese supply chains. In terms of foreign direct investment, well, what can we do in order to penetrate also the Chinese market? How can we negotiate better with the Chinese? In terms of sub regional and regional integration, how can we come together to become more competitive, more uh, uh, and in that area of policies, and of course, uh, at the global level, negotiations? I hope I didn't ex not extend myself very much, but I just wanted to bring the whole picture. Thank you.
Thank you. That was very good. Um, I think it sort of set out a lot of the key variables. So let me now ask Eric. Um, one of the articles uh, in here and one of the uh, arguments you've been making is now, there is an inherent risk in terms of U.S. market share um, because of the rise of China, but also the risk of, you sort of alluded to it, uh, corruption, um, challenges in terms of the rule of law and the way these deals are made and the way China provides assistance. Is there anything the U.S. can do to, to adjust to this uh, jogger? Yeah. Well, first of all, Chris, thank you for uh, putting this uh, forum together along with the Peterson Institute. I think it's outstanding. I think the issue of America's Quarterly is, is outstanding. And I also want to thank Mac for his uh, very kind remarks about me in his uh, comments. And so uh, uh, with that said, it's a privilege to join this, this panel. I, I think also in just listening to the presentations that have been made so far, um, you know, there's really a lot of depth that we've already touched on that has put this question into perspective. And oftentimes we're seeing or hearing uh, voices about it's no issue or it's a huge issue or, you know, crisis or whatever it is. And I think just putting it into perspective, I think, is a very valuable service. So I thank you for that and congratulate you for that. And that's why I want to begin my uh, brief commentary this morning, which is to say I think we have to understand that Latin America isn't existing in a vacuum. It is in a global scenario in terms of how China and Chinese entities are engaging in the world. And so I think we've, we've seen a lot of Chinese investment and trade with Africa, certainly with East Asia. Certainly the Prime Minister of Canada was over in China just this week. There is a lot of engagement and you have to look at this relationship in that broader context because this isn't a Chinese strategy for Latin America, it is a Chinese strategy to feed its 1.4 billion people. And this is something that I think we have to keep in mind because what it means then is that it's fundamentally a strategy that is developed for domestic purposes in Beijing, which is to say uh, it is the way that the Chinese leadership is looking to maintain its legitimacy politically that it doesn't obtain through the ballot box. And that is by growing standards and by keeping its population um, uh, in a positive growth uh, period and moving more and more people into the middle class, which frankly China has done very, very well in the past several years. And so in that context, we can first of all say what this relationship isn't. It isn't a power projection strategy into the Western Hemisphere. It is not an effort to militarize the Western Hemisphere. It's not an attempt to create a platform from which to attack the United States or take over the Panama Canal, et cetera, et cetera. Sometimes you hear these types of issues. That's not what it is. That's not to say there aren't military relationships or sales of weapons, et cetera. It's not to say there aren't challenges with cyber activities. We've heard that a little bit already this morning. That is true, but fundamentally this is an economic and trade and investment strategy. And so if you look at it in that perspective, what can be the United States, what should be the United States response? Well, if it's simply a matter of having a new competitor in the region, frankly, that's a good thing for the United States. We preach open markets, we preach competition, we preach the ability of equal uh, players to compete for the same types of economic opportunities. And frankly, the theory being more competition is better because it forces people to be sharper, to compete more, all of those things. And that's not necessarily a bad thing uh, in global markets, just like it is in economic, in, in domestic markets. So if that's what's really going on, then a, an appropriate US strategy would be to promote transparency, open markets, rules of the game, things that we all need to abide by, not just the United States, but frankly all the trading partners in the Western Hemisphere. And I think to large measure that's, that's been what's going on. But I think that there is also a very uh, important um, additional thing that's occurring. And this is why, uh, from my perspective, this is a little bit of concern uh, in terms of China's activities in the region. And that is that the idea of promoting a certain uh, system of values in the Western Hemisphere that focuses on things like uh, the rule of law, the respect for uh, democratic governance, anti-corruption, uh, things that the United States and other partners, I hasten to add, uh, have been trying to promote in the Western Hemisphere context for a long time. Uh, rule, uh, excuse me, labor rights, respect for the environment, uh, activities that we have previously been able to promote through things like uh, global financial assistance through trade agreements, that leverage is being perhaps reduced to the extent that China becomes more and more engaged in the Western Hemisphere and doesn't similarly follow some of those same uh, practices. And let me be very specific about some of this. It's not 
a point of leverage to be able to use the IMF to talk about um, uh, governance structures if a country isn't a member of the IMF uh, system or uh, doesn't have a program with the IMF or has no need for the IMF. <laughs> There's no leverage there in the context of trying to condition aid for certain behaviors. Now, some people say that's a very good thing, and there's a whole movement that says the IMF is bad, et cetera, et cetera. That's not my point. I'm not trying to get into that. Well, all I'm saying in the context of the U.S. ability to promote what we have traditionally considered to be U.S. values begins to be reduced. And so this is a factor that really has to be taken into account in the conduct of U.S. foreign policy in the region. And I would hasten to add that there are other countries that are similarly impacted. Um, this idea that Mac um, raised in his comments about uh, the blog poster from Brazil, I think, hits it just right, which is to say, look, China brings money. They ask for nothing in return. It's exactly right. The United States brings relationships. We ask for a lot in return. Now, if you're on the receiving end of that, it's, a lot, it's liberating to be able to say, look, we don't have to anymore abide by this strict uh, you know, ex expectations in terms of how business is conducted, et cetera. But at the same time, the question has to be asked, is this the best way for countries in the Western Hemisphere to be developing? And I think that's an open question. And I think it goes to the, the point of the United States now needs to, we need to think about what are the tools that we have to be able to pro promote those things. So let me end very briefly with suggesting a couple things that I think U.S. can and should be doing. First of all, we have to recognize that the world has changed. It's no longer the United States in the Western Hemisphere. Now there are a lot of competitors. Again, that's not a bad thing. But we need to begin to contend for the Western Hemisphere. We need to fight for the region. We need to know that this needs to be a priority, number one. Number two, what does that mean? It means that we need to do a better job with the trade and investment agenda. We need to begin to, to think of things like the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, in a strategic way, not just as a means to engage with Asia, but more broadly to exchange in, uh, uh, work with the Western Hemisphere as well. We need to think about the promotion of soft power, uh, exchanges, language study, all the things that the United States has traditionally done, but in a period of tight budgets, well, those are quick and easy hits for the budget acts. We need to think more broadly and more strategically about that. And finally, I would suggest that we shouldn't just assume that countries in the region are just willingly uh, running into an embrace with China and running away from the United States. There is that possibility. But I think we need to do a better job of finding avenues of tangible cooperation with countries in the region that impact their relations, for example, with China. And let me be very specific and suggest the issue of currency is one that it doesn't just affect the United States and U.S. exporters and manufacturers. It also affects Brazil. It also affects Mexico. It also affects the countries in the region that, yeah, China's going to set its own currency policies based on what China does. But this is a way that we can really work with countries in the region to say, we're in this together. We have common interests, and we can work together. And that we need to begin to change the dynamics so that it's not China and the Western Hemisphere against the United States, but the United States working with our partners in the region to pursue common interests in a way that it's not anti-China, but it certainly promotes our own uh, common agenda. So I would leave it there. Hopefully that's been at least somewhat provocative so that we can get, uh, get the conversation. Well, it certainly provoked Arvind, who I was going to call on you anyway, so I'm glad you volunteered, and then I'll throw it open for questions. Yeah. Uh, so, so let me, uh, I think uh, uh, both uh, the presentation was, uh, was really very useful, and uh, but let me just uh, build on what uh, Eric just said. Um, one on, you know, as someone who's been, you know, who's been in the aid, who's been with the IMF and seen, you know, Western financial lending, either directly or indirectly. I mean, on the one hand, I have some sympathy for saying, wow, you know, China is very different and, you know, they're going to undermine Western values and all the things that we believe in, rule of law, et cetera, et cetera. But I have to be a little bit, you know, you know, I, I kind of react a little bit uh, negatively because it's not as if the record of you know Western intervention in terms of values, et cetera, et cetera, ha has either been a terribly great, terribly effective, or and certainly it has only perpetuated the the illusion that you know these things can be done from the outside. I, I think uh, that caveat I think we should we should keep in mind. But I think uh, where I do want to agree wholeheartedly with Eric, but actually go much further, is to, is to raise the following question. You know, I think there is a big issue for Latin America as it is, as there is for Asia, for example, which is, do you want to deal with China, 
you know, bilaterally, you know, to bilateral trade and investment relationships? Or do you want to deal with it much more collectively? And Eric said, you know, Latin America as a whole, I would generalize it, you know, the bigger question is whether we should deal with China multilaterally. And I think the exchange rate is really an excellent example of that because, as Eric quite rightly said, I mean, and one of the, my own themes in the last two, three years has been, you know, the exchange, China's exchange rate policy, it may have been bad for the US, I, I don't know, but it's actually been, you know, has had negative effects on other developing countries around the world, you know, leading to you know some some de some deindustrializing effects on other countries, which in, in some ways are much more <laughs> consequential in the long run. So the question is that you know how do you address this? And to me, the best way to do it is to do it multilaterally rather than than bilaterally. Now, but but the question is, I mean, but but the point is, it's not happened multilaterally. And, and, and it raises the question as to why. You know, this is not just true for Mexico and Brazil. It's true for India. It's true for Turkey. It's true for South Africa and so on. So, uh, but I think you can't have it both ways. And, and this is what I want to leave you with. I mean, you can't say on the one hand, you know, oh, let's do bilateral deals. Let's do all these things. And yet kind of say, oh, but, you know, it's a problem. We'll do this multi. There is a tension, a fundamental tension there. And I think the more, but it's a larger point that I make in my book is that one way to address China's dominance is, in fact, for a multilateral response, with the US in the lead, uh, definitely, but other countries, you know, where their interests coincide with those of the US, I think they should come together. And the exchange rate is just a great um, uh, experiment and an illustration of that point. Yeah, thank you very much. A very good point. One thing I'd actually submit and sort of is that the, the issue about the IMF isn't so much that the IMF and external donors can actually influence or promote specific behaviors. It's that the, the, the possibility of free money uh, given without conditions, dealt with behind closed doors, can actually subvert a lot of those values. It may not promote them. In the Western institution, they're not so good at promoting them, and certainly it's done so imperfectly. But certainly, the possibility of corruption of money can undermine those values uh, over the long term. But that's, uh, let me just open it up for questions, because we sort of white knuckled our way here through until the question and answer period. I'm sure you have a lot of questions. And so, what we'll do, if you have questions on the previous panel, too, um, this is sort of where we come into the charity uh, benefit concert type of routine where people can come up and answer all of us on one stage. So, sir, and please identify yourself. Is the mic open? Yes. Yeah. Uh, my name is Dennis Jones. Uh, like uh, uh, I mean, I also worked at the IMF. Um, I think one of the interesting things about China, and you focused uh, the discussion on China and the Western Hemisphere, is that um, you know, China is as big a global player in many respects as the United States. So if you like, it's more like two heavyweights working their way around each other uh, the United States, you might like to say, thought it had the ring to itself. Russia showed, or the Soviet Union showed, that that wasn't the case over several decades. China's now, if you like, getting into the ring and showing, again, it's not the case. And one of the things, you know, let's say from a Chinese point of view, and I'm not Chinese, obviously, is that you know, China doesn't need anybody's permission to do what it wants to do. Uh, some of the debate's very interesting because you use language like subvert and words like corruption as if they are, say, exclusive to what China is doing and therefore in the negative. If you are a Latin American country looking for investment which isn't coming from elsewhere, or an African country looking for investment which isn't coming elsewhere, unless you have an IMF program or a World Bank support, and China comes along with a $1 billion investment to get some sector of your economy working, that's not subverting anything um, other than the other people not getting their chance to work with you. So I think it's quite interesting to sort of look at how the other side looks at China and sort of turn the whole thing over this morning. You know, I, I do financial work now in my spare time. You know, the European Union is very quick to grab hold of China to help it out of its present predicament, which is the Greek bailout. When China jumps in and says, OK, we're going to continue to invest in these junk bonds, that's a good thing. Now, you could say it's subverting the the, 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 the the understood policy framework that would say Greek, Greece needs to adjust, Greece needs to do all the things that the IMF and institutions like that support. But it's also the realistic thing, which is like, it gives breathing space. So in terms of the negotiation, I think you've got to decide, OK, if you've got two people, two big people in an elevator, and, one, and they're both breathing in and out at the same time, it can get 
kind of tight. If they decide to coordinate their breathing in and out, it seems like an okay space. And I think part of the argument is, you know, does the US or other, you know, big uh, countries want to sort of give China the space or they're going to try and hustle and bustle and huff them, puff their chest and say, okay, you know, we breathe and you don't. That's all. Thank you very much. Um, we'll have the panelists com comment on that later. Are there any more questions? Yes, you step up to the microphone, go ahead. Introduce yourself if you can, too. Hi, uh, my name is Ralph Watkins. I'm with the U.S. International Trade Commission. Um, Brazil is the victim of its own success in terms of exporting to, uh, to China. Uh, it exports uh, petroleum, uh, iron ore, uh, soybeans, uh, and beef. And it imports a lot of consumer goods, a lot of intermediate goods. Uh, the uh, Brazilian real has been rising. Uh, such that uh, the, the local manufacturers are having a real tough time competing with uh, imports from China for, these, for, for manufactured goods. What is the appropriate policy response by Brazil to this influx of manufactured goods from China? Okay. Um, let's take another question and then we'll, because maybe uh, Ted and others have some comments they want to give. So are there any other questions? Oh, someone's on the way, making their way across the aisle. Jennifer Murgy, State Department. Um, just maybe a follow-on to that question, looking at the rules of the game, transparency, anti-corruption, um, environment, labor laws. To what degree are some of these problems also a question of enforcement of the target, uh, the, the countries that are receiving Chinese investment? And I actually would include that uh, some of the vulnerabilities of the local manufacturing sector, perhaps maybe there are inherent indigenous uh, weaknesses that the Chinese um, import is simply highlighting. Thank you. Great, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, what we'll do is actually um, is have the uh, three previous panels come up. I think Ted or select among yourselves. You have a few comments because we have discussion of sort of what values and uh, are, is it really subversion or is it just simply a different uh, uh, game? Uh, the other one is, of course, is the question of Brazil, and, and the other one is the question of sort of enforcement. How much, and I think the enforcement one particularly relates to the, the Peterson Institute. Ted? Oh. Um, <clears throat> allow me to try and answer, respond to that question, but also to highlight another point that uh, Barbara alluded to, but I think almost everybody here would find fascinating in the Peru case. Um, you recall that the Peruvian mining law was changed so that a certain percentage of the revenues had to go back to the local communities. And the OECD investors led by Antamina said, I, I, we were in the midst of a commodity boom, if, if these millions of dollars go back to the local community, there's liable to be corruption. They don't have budgeting uh, experience. We need capacity building. These were the mining companies saying this. Um, we want these resources to be well spent. We have to pay them. We don't want them to go to just football stadiums and you know brothers-in-law in the construction business. So they said we have to create civil society as partners. Peru had, Barbara alluded to this, Peru had active uh, uh, um, NGOs, but they mostly engaged in denuncias. I mean, that is to say they weren't looking for partnerships, they were just looking to expose bad practices. There's nothing the matter with that. But, so, um, the mining companies brought in global witness and a couple, Transparency International, and they also funded and dialogued with local Peruvian NGOs so that you now have a fairly robust set of public-private partnerships engaged in healthcare, engaged in transparency, engaged in community development, et cetera. So there was a, it, it wasn't just the national government 
engaging in stronger enforcement, there really was, we discovered, a new structure of civil society um, which had some revenues. Now, is that happening in, in Angola? I don't think so. Is that happening in Brazil? I have no idea, but I would love to know if you see some of the same process elsewhere. Ines, do you have any? Yes, the, uh, on this issue of, uh, of foreign direct investment, I mean, the history, with exception of the case of Peru and Chile in, in the 1990s, is very recent, the history of Chinese investment in the region. So it, it, it's evolving. And when we look at foreign direct investment from other sources, it has a long, in natural resources, it has a long history, 60, 70 years. So things, things are changing, and the fact that now, as it was said before, Chinese, for example, investors bring their own personnel as compared, for example, with European investment in natural resources where they tend to hire local engineers, that not necessarily needs to stay the same. Yes, we're starting to know each other, so that is, it, it could, could be evolving in the future. And I think the broader issue is, regardless of the origin of foreign direct investment, is how to benefit from foreign direct investment, not only the quantity and the quality of that foreign direct investment. And that issue, even related to the governance of natural resources, is on the agenda of many countries So in, in, in Latin America. So I guess in the years to come, we're going to see much evolving in, in that arena. Great. Eric, let's go to you, and Arvind, I'm going to give you a little final word. Uh, just a couple of quick comments, and I appreciate what Inez just said, because I agree with that. So let me, let me try to address a little bit the first question, which I think is spot on. It's an excellent question, and um, frankly, I, I agree with the questioner in terms of whose values. And it's really tough to resist somebody who comes with a bag of cash and says, here you go, uh, and we're not going to have any conditionality put on it. That's a really tough incentive to fight against. And, the, the way that what I was trying to suggest perhaps is that the United States and other countries uh, need to do a better job contending for the region means to say we need to show tangibly why it is in the benefit of our trading and investment partners that corruption should be uh, reduced, that, uh, that the system that we're promoting is of benefit over the longer term for the development of the region itself. I think there's some really good answers for those questions, but I don't think we've necessarily done a very good job promoting them, at least since the end of the Cold War. There was a whole, um, a whole industry uh, during the Cold War of, saying, of trying to show, well, this versus that, or this is what you know, works, et cetera, et cetera. And not to suggest that we want to go back to the Cold War, that's not at all my point, but simply to say that we can do a better job, and I think must do a better job, of trying to promote the benefits of this type of system in the region. Otherwise, the temptation is going to be very strong, and I think what you're going to see over time, to the extent that that relationship continues and does not necessarily evolve the way, although I think it will, and I think it is, the way Inez is suggesting, but if it doesn't, what you're seeing right now is essentially a deindustrialization of the region in the China trade, and Brazil was one of the questions, and what you're seeing in terms of the mix of exports of Brazil, the percentage of, of commodities and primary goods has increased, whereas the percentage of manufactured goods has decreased, so you're actually going down the scale of value added. You're actually subtracting value in terms of the export uh, relationship that Brazil and other commodities exporters are doing. That is a fundamental uh, problem if, if your supposition is that you're trying to increase value and create in value-added and knowledge-based economy for the developing world. That's a problem because it takes you back exactly to the, to this, to the world that, if it ever existed, the dependencia theorists fought against. And so you have this very ironic historical twist. What's happening now is a region that is actively trying to, in some ways, reject the close economic relationship with some traditional partners is seeking an economic relationship with parties that are actually returning to the economics of the past. That's a question that I'm not sure is fully uh, understood in the region, and I think we can do a better job promoting that. But I also think, ultimately, it's going to be the countries themselves that will, will will understand that and and that's going to take a little bit of time and it's going to take a little bit of space to show what's what's actually happening but you are going to begin to see i think somewhat of a backlash and you're already seeing that develop in terms of land ownership in argentina land ownership in brazil so you are beginning to see a consciousness arising in south america particularly about what is chinese investment really mean not just in the immediate term what does it really mean for longer term development of the region i think that's the real question
Quick fact and just a quick note of irony. Um, in the chart article, in this issue, 75% uh, of Brazil's exports to China in 2010 were primary products. So clearly the bulk. One thing, you mentioned the dependency theory, of course, that was what created, led to the creation of Cepal and Eclac under Raul Prebisch. And in fact, they are, again, on the front cutting edge of pointing out a lot of these uh, you know, path-dependent or potential risks of, of uh, dependency. Arvind, I'm going to give you the final word on it. It's early in the day. We'll all leave here depressed. <laughs> Sometimes I, I uh, you know, kind of describe the effect of China on other developing countries. Uh, it's kind of, I say, possibly the three and a half horsemen of the apocalypse. Uh, 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 why do I say that? One, China's growth means commodity prices, secular, are going to increase, uh, are, are increasing. Two, China has an undervalued exchange rate. You know. so, so what that means is for uh, countries in Brazil and Africa, the, the incentives are going exactly in the opposite direction from what they need to from the point of view of long run development. You know, development is about producing more complex goods, more sophisticated goods, and less primary commodities, and it's going. So those are two horsemen. The third horseman uh, is aid. You know, especially in Africa, less so in Latin America. China gives aid, and all of you have raised the problems that come with Chinese aid. The fourth is FDI, and I think that's half, only half a horseman because, you know, we don't know. It, it could be good, it could be bad, you know, it's possible that the conditions associated with it undermine values, but on the other hand, if it's just very effective and they're able to build the roads and get the thing out, it might be useful. So, so, so that's three and a half horsemen. Now, the, the problem is, I think that on the one hand, I think countries like Brazil need to address things that they can address, like the exchange rate, multilaterally. I think that's the way forward. But uh, the, I mean, predominant burden of how to cope with that is domestic. You know, 95% of how to cope with that is domestic. You know, whether it's in terms of spending resources well, whether in terms of values, corruption, etc., it's domestic. And I think, therefore, uh, I think whether it's China or the U.S., uh, you know, uh, we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that you know the task of you know building development or fostering development is primarily with these with Latin American countries themselves and, and they shouldn't get distracted too much uh, there is a there are three and a half half horsemen out there but they still control their own destinies yes final comment in that, in that direction. They are moving with the right policies domestic at the macro level. You mentioned Prevish with productive development policies to try to va add value, more technology, etc., and trying with regionally to come with some type of agreement as to how to move forward. Great. Is it part of your charter that you have to mention Prevish in every presentation? <laughs> um, you mentioned it first. I, I did. I did. I'm a big fan of No, no, no. I, I think that we've forgotten a lot of the lessons. Um, let me say, first of all, that one of the, I'm glad that Arvind came, and one of the things that we try to do with the magazine is really try to bring out um, outside analysts, to sort of break out of, if you will, sort of the, the pigeonhole and some of the incestuousness we all exist in when it comes to Latin American scholars, to bring in outside views. And in this issue in particular, we have two articles by China scholars who don't know anything about Latin America explaining China to Latin Americanists. So thank you, Arvin, for coming. Um, let me also say that the next three issues of America's Quarterly, the next one will be on social inclusion. It comes out uh, in late April. One of the things we'll be doing is developing a social inclusion index, um, which we hope to use to be able to track uh, social inclusion across the hemisphere, um, country by country. And then over time, every year, we'll include issues of access to housing, access to education, access to health care, um, by gender and by race and ethnicity as well as political participation, political rights, and civil rights. Um, and then the summer issue is going to be on uh, gender, uh, the increasing role of women in politics, uh, boardrooms, and uh, the classrooms. And then actually the fall issue will be on natural resource extraction, and we're doing a number of case studies for that. So um, let me first of all thank the GE Foundation for supporting this. Um, and also, of course, thank our partners in this, the Peterson Institute for International Economics, uh, Barbara, who's been our, our partner and our collaborator and researcher on this, and has been a great uh, contributor on this, uh, Ted Moran, who did a great job on the study and I think added a number of uh, elements within the, the article that he talked about, which are unique to what his previous works were. I think, and Julia uh, Muir, who has uh, contributed to the articles, and I want to appreciate that. And then, um, actually, to the uh, COA team here in Washington, which helped pull this together. 
Um, and then to all the panelists, Mac, who's no longer here, Arvind, Ines, and uh, Eric. And then last to uh, my incredible and wonderful team of editors at America's Quarterly who uh, managed to pull this off every three months, and I still don't know how we managed to do it. Just to name a few names, Jar Jason Marzak, Nina Agarwal, who's here, um, as well as Matt Aho and a few others who are in New York. But uh, thank you to all of you. And uh, magazines are for sale outside. Sorry for the brazen plug. Uh, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much.